why it's going, but it's not turned on, so there we go. Um, I was actually going to suggest, Sean, uh, and I didn't get to you, I thought it'd be neat for uh, 4th of July if you photoshopped me with the Uncle Sam hat on. Don't you think that would work? You know, don't want to make a good Uncle Sam with my beard? At <laughs> any rate, uh, I'm, I'm expecting these guys are so good up there. I'm expecting that'll show up probably in the second service someplace. But uh, um, it's great to hear beer for 4th of July. I want to take a few seconds to talk about briefly as we I was introduced today. And actually, it does relate to what we're talking about because we're talking about a nation of Israel. It's going to be the book of Ezra, by the way, if you want to try to find that and take your time to getting there. Uh, we're going to talk about the book of Ezra, but it's Israel went the wrong direction and consequently round up the wrong, at the wrong spot. And uh, that's what we're all talking about in Ezra and Nehemiah this morning. But I'd like to just talk about my, one of my favorite subjects that I think is most misunderstood. And it's gonna take a few seconds and it'll, it'll kind of, I think, relate to what we're talking about this morning as we uh, move into Ezra and Nehemiah. And that's this phrase that everybody bats around today called separation of church and state. Um, most people don't know what that means and they take it out of context and over the years it's evolved into something that it was never intended to mean uh, to, uh, and I want to make sure that we uh, as those who are believers in faith don't misunderstand it also because probably we've been uh, tainted by a lot of the thought process of the day. So let me just say briefly the, the Declaration of Independence says this, we hold these selves to be self-evident that men are created, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain and unalienable rights that belong, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, endowed by the Creator, uh, most of you know Thomas Jefferson. He wrote this document, put, went through numerous drafts on it, and uh, he acknowledged the Creator. Now, um, the, Thomas Jefferson was a deist, which means he didn't believe in Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He believed in only one God, um, so he, he falls into that camp, but he definitely believed that, you know, there was a God, and he, uh, so that's why I think he used the creator of terminology here in our Declaration of Independence, but it goes back to that very first statement. Most people think that the uh, separation of church and state is in which uh, document of the United States? Where is it found? Separation of church and state. Huh? Yeah. Well, most people think it's found in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Well, let's take a look at the First Amendment to the Constitution. This is called the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments. The first one says, on the beginning of it says, um, this is half of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, there's a lot of groups out today called, uh, there's the, uh, a lot of atheist groups, there's this uh, uh, freedom from religion group, there's the group uh, by this Weinstein guy who is a, basically an atheist, atheistic Jew who tries to take everything, uh, everything religious out of the military if he can, um, and they all uh, land on this first phrase, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And of course, we're not making a law, a lot of the stuff they're bringing up is not a, has, has anything to do with the laws. Um, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now what happens when a high school teacher gets fired because he kneeled to pray with his kids on the football field after the game? That to me would be seem like it's prohibiting the free exercise of religion. What happens when a, a, a kid is said he can't uh, carry a Bible in school? And by the way, you're allowed to do that. Uh, you can't do that. I carried one every day practically in high school because uh, I lived in the era right, uh, not uh, long, maybe five or 10 years in high school after they took the Bibles out of school. You can do that. When they, when they say that um, um, a teacher can't have the Bible on their desk or they can't respond to a question or when they say that you can't have the Ten Commandments sitting on the uh, government property or you can't have a nativity scene there. Um, a lot of them saying they, they say you can't, they're trying to take the Ten Commandments out of the, uh, a lot of, off of any government property. Um, <laughs> interesting. Uh, if you know the, uh, where the Supreme Court building is, the very top of it, on the outside, there's a lot of uh, different figures, and the central figure in the top of it is who? Moses, who wrote the Ten Commandments, okay? So this does not say we can't, we can't practice our faith in public, and even in governmental settings. In fact, the, even the Senate has a chaplain still that, that will, will give prayer, and I find it very interesting. Whenever our nation goes through a crisis, what do they say? Please pray. Pray for this person. Pray. It's okay to pray when we're in a crisis, but every other time, no. And we've raised a generation of, of people who uh, do not recognize what this amendment makes. Now, I will tell you that the separation, the word separation of church and state, came from a letter that the writer of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, sent to a group. Does anybody know what group he sent this letter to? 
Well, okay, we'll put the two together. The Baptists in, in Connecticut, in Danbury, Connecticut. It was a group of Baptists, and there are five Baptist, six Baptist distinctives, basically, that we look at, and we don't dwell on that a whole lot, but there's a core things that Baptists normally believe. One of those cores is we believe in the separation of church and state. So of all people we who are related to Baptists should be able to say we know what this means. John Clark and Roger Williams uh, founded Rhode Island. I've been in Newport, Rhode Island and stood at John Clark's grave. He actually was the one that was more involved than even Roger Williams was, um, who founded Rhode Island, who founded the first uh, Baptist church in Providence, Rhode Island, and eventually just went off on his way. He was a seeker. He was a little bit of, uh, uh, flaky, you might say. But John, John Clark was a, was a Baptist pastor in Rhode Island for many years. He actually went to England, secured the charter for Rhode Island, Island, uh, ensuring freedom. Why? Because John Clark, let's go back a second, the, many of those who came over from England came to escape what? Religious tyranny, okay? They had to worship a certain way, and if they weren't, they were thrown in jail. So they came to the United States to, prevent, to, to have freedom of worship. John Clark, guess where he spent time? In a Massachusetts prison, because he didn't do what the Puritans in Massachusetts said that he should be doing and what he would should be preaching. And so consequently, they brought this lack of separation of church and state from England over here to the United States. And so it makes sense that the Danbury Baptists in Connecticut, right next to Rhode Island, where John Clark had been thrown into prison in Massachusetts, would be concerned that perhaps the Constitution didn't go far enough when we say the First Amendment here. And so they wrote to the president and said, how do we know that they're not going to do the same thing they did in England with the Anglican Church as a state church, or in some of the Scandinavian countries, or Germany where the Lutheran church was the, the state church and, and actually paid their pastors and, and you had to give that tax into the, into the nation for, uh, many years ago. How do we prevent that? And Thomas Jefferson wrote back to them this letter and we, part of the letter is what we see on the next screen here. And I'll read it to you. Believing with you, responding to the, this, is, this is Thomas Jefferson saying this in 1801, 100 and, what's that, 50, uh, 16 years ago? Um, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between a man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or worship, I contemplate with sincere reverence that act which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. And that is where that phrase came from. Basically what he was saying is the Constitution will remain in effect. Nobody from the Constitution, nobody, no legislature is gonna make a law and throw you into jail because you're not preaching a certain thing. And we're not gonna establish a state church. In other words, we're not gonna do like England or any place else and establish a particular denomination as the state church. He wasn't talking about Christianity in general, whatever, because if you look on many places in the United States Capitol and other places, there are many references to Christianity. I'm not saying we're a Christian nation and that's the only, any faith is, is guaranteed in the United States, but it's not saying that you can't have evidences of a faith in a public place, even on government property because the law of separation it only said that there's not gonna be, we're not gonna come and stay, uh, say you can't do what you're doing and throwing you in jail because of what you're doing as a church. And also, we're not gonna establish a denomination that's gonna say, you know, you pay your taxes and we're gonna support the uh, Conservative Baptist Association pastors from these taxes because that's the new denomination. Or we're gonna establish the Lutheran church as the denomination or whatever other church it might be, the Catholic church. So that is the basis of this uh, separation of church and state, and it doesn't have anything to do with what a lot of people think today, but we have the free exercise of faith, and it's simply said, uh, his indication is that we would not establish one denomination, one Christian denomination over every other Christian or non-Christian denomination as a state church. Uh, and so, so many people don't realize that this day. Today, we're gonna look at a, um, a, a nation who was in turmoil and they did not follow God's laws as we are not following many principles as we get further and further away from God's word as more and more people do not know what God's word says. I was watching a TV program the other night. Uh, actually, it was a movie, I think. I forget what it was now. I had some downtime. I forget what it was. They, what, do you remember what that was? They made some reference and it was, and it was based on the source of the Bible. And I'm saying, how many people did that just go over their head? They have no idea what that phrase meant because today our people do not understand what the scriptures teach. And Israel did that and consequently went into captivity for it. So we want to look at this today. Uh, but as we, as we go to this, let me ask you, um, how many people um, um, uh, think that it's important who we elect for president of the United States? 
Okay, now I can guarantee you, in a congregation this size, we probably have many people who were very uh, upset and chewing their fingernails and very unhappy over the last eight years with their president. I can also guarantee you that there's a lot of people today, uh, perhaps in here also, who are chewing their nails and very unhappy with the current president. I'm saying that it's important that we put in office those who need to be in office. And we need to do something. But my question is, are God's hands tied? Is he up there wringing his hands saying, oh, the last eight years were horrible. I, uh, they put somebody in I didn't want in. Or this year, uh, oh, they put somebody in this year that I didn't want in. Are, is God upset about that? Well, we're going to look at the scriptures today where he's going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to find that God has control over leaders regardless of what position or what uh, place you actually take in looking at these things. Let me ask you some additional questions. Is God totally dependent dependent on who we elect to office? Yes or no? Will God judge a nation on how closely we keep his word? Is the United States headed in the wrong or right direction today? Can we have an impact on the direction our nation is headed? Okay. Today we're going to look at what happens when people don't follow God's word. So turn with me, if you will, to the book of, Exodus, of Ezra, excuse me. Ezra, I may say Exodus every once in a while simply because it starts with an E and it's very close. But you have the Old Testament, you've got, you got those historical books such as Judges. If you look at the Old Testament, you have Judges and Chronicles and Kings and Samuel. Well, this comes right after that. In fact, the first two verses of Ezra are the same exact wording, the same exact verses as what's in the last two verses of Second Chronicles. So it kind of picks it up and overlaps just a little bit. Let's all stand and read the uh, uh, just seven verses of what we're going to look at today. We'll look at first in cha chapters one and two. I'm going to go back and forth again between this side and this side, and so the people on tape and the, who are listening at home or uh, eventually want to um, listen to this on tape can hear uh, it, so I will say it also with you. But let's start on this side, reading the first verse, and this side going to the second verse. And I try to pick the verses that didn't have a whole lot of names in them. Hopefully you know how to say Cyrus, okay? This side, speak with me, if you will. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor, at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the father's households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, even everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. All those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with goods, with cattle, and with valuables, aside from all that was given as a freewill offering. Also, King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's be seated. And let's take a look at some background. Now, it's... Uh, I'm a detail kind of guy. I like your context. If you hate history, okay, you can, don't go to sleep for the next three minutes, okay? It's not going to be long, okay? But um, when you're reading God's words, it's important to know the background and uh, history. Just like our nation, we celebrate 200 years of independence, and we know, we know a little bit about the war. We know about the Civil War. We know special things. Uh, in order to understand what God's saying in some of these Old Testament passages, we have to be, understand a little bit of what God says and what happened. So let me go back to 722 B.C. Israel was living in the land. They had not followed after God. And in fact, if you want, and I hope you're taking your notes, and you're going to uh, write on those and uh, record some stuff. But if you take those notes and look on the back, a more detailed thing of this is listed on the back of those notes. In 722, Assyria, 
which is north of there, and today we know it as Syria, okay, conquered Israel, the northern 10 tribes, because they had not been doing what God wanted them to do. So the northern 10 tribes go, and they're integrated with Assyria, and those tribes, uh, when they're integrated with the, um, uh, the Gentile population, become what we call Samaria, or Samaritans. And so they were half-breeds, which is why the Jews never liked them, okay? The, the Jews that didn't um, uh, co-marry and co-mingle with those that were not believers. So 722, they conquer the northern tribes, they go away. In 608, Nineveh falls, but Nineveh was the uh, capital of Assyria. So it falls and it's demolished. In 606, Nebuchadnezzar comes on, and he's been actually on board. If you look at your notes and in, in your uh, things, he came into power in uh, 658 and, uh, excuse me, he came into power in 606 and went to 562. Nebuchadnezzar uh, was uh, before him. So in 606, Nebuchadnezzar comes in and he goes into Israel and he conquers Israel. This is the southern two tribes, which is about half of Israel where Jerusalem is. He conquers that bottom half. Um, and he takes with him people out with him at that time. He comes back 10 years later and does the same thing. He again takes a bunch of exiles because they had some uprisings and they weren't doing as good, so he goes back in and he, he takes off a bunch of more people. Finally, 10 years later in 586, he's had it. They've rebelled enough, they've been problems enough, and he comes in and takes them all out. Uh, and doesn't take everybody out of them, but takes a whole bunch of the rest, takes the royal family, takes, takes the priest, I mean, takes anybody who's any, who has any smarts about him, who's wealthy, who has anything that he thinks he can use, he takes them all out with him. He takes all the goods out of the temple, all the special uh, stuff that they had in there, you know, the, the candelabras, I mean, it'd be, it'd be comparable to our communion set, but it would be a, a lot nicer and multiple things. He collects them all, and he takes them all with him because they're all silver and gold and valuable, and by taking the, the God's stuff of the people you conquered you're saying my God's better than your God and so he takes all this stuff takes it back to Babylon takes all the people and he destroys the temple and burns Jerusalem to the ground done all that's left behind are the poorest of the people to kind of hang around in the land and do what they can they go to, uh, to Babylon and in 536 to 529, uh, the Persian king Cyrus comes there. And if you want to read some of, the, some of this history, you can go back to the book of Daniel, who lived during this time, who was actually one of those exiles that Nebuchadnezzar took out of Israel. You can read his book, and his book will tell you about the different kings he dealt with and how things went with them. And then in 636, um, this king uh, Cyrus um, has people return to as we read earlier, has them return to Jerusalem to build a temple, and 50,000 people we'll find went with him. Now, all of this is so important to give you the, the background for what's taking place. Now, let me go, let me go a little further into the background, and um, let's, let's take a look at the passage, if you will, with me, at chapter um, 1, verse 1, and I'm just going to stop with the first half of the first verse, and we're not going to do that with every verse. Verse 1, chapter 1 is only like 11 verses long. We're going to do chapter 1 to 2 today. Does anybody know how, how, many, how many verses there are on chapter 2? 70. <laughs> so we got 80, what's that make, 81 verses. We're, not, we're going to go through them all today. We're not going to go real detail in chapter 7, but I'm going to just introduce you to them. Let's start with chapter 1. The first half of the first verse says this. Uh, now, in the first year, Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, stop. In order to fill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was one of the Israeli prophets. He was there during these times that we talk about here, the 606 and 596 and 586. He was prophesying to Israel, and Israel wasn't listening to him very well. Um, eventually, in 586, uh, they take him as a captive and go down to Egypt and take him with them because they didn't want to stay under the people that were there and didn't want to be captured by uh, Nebuchadnezzar, even though he said, don't do this. Jeremiah continuously prophesied to them. And he prophesied, if you want to take a look with me, let's just take a brief uh, journey through Jeremiah. And I'm going to look at chapter 25, verse 12 in uh, the book of Jeremiah and read it to you. And it says this. This is part of Jeremiah's prophecy to Israel in chapter 25, verse 12. Then it will be when 70 years are completed. Actually, let's go back to the previous verse. And this whole land shall be desolate and a horror, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. 
verse 12. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation, and I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations. And then you move over just a couple more chapters to chapter 29 and verse 10. And Jeremiah continues this prophecy with these words. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back into this place. And then this verse, you've heard it said many times, some of you may have this as your favorite verse, verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity that to give you a future and a hope. Those are words that Jeremiah wrote, actually not to the believer, although that's a good enough uh, you know, thing for us, but he wrote that to Israel saying, this is my plans for you. And his plans were 70 years and done. Now what was the problem? Let's take one look and one more scripture to give you this background. Look back, if you will, um, to the um, book of uh, Chronicles. And let's see. Oh no, let's go back to Leviticus. Leviticus 25, 2 to 7. Leviticus 25, 2 to 7. We won't read all these verses. And why am I going back here? Well, I could tell you this, but I want to show you that we're, to, we're doing something this in Scripture. Okay, we're, we're handling the Scriptures. This is not just out of my head for a history lesson. Chap, verse 2 uh, says in chapter 25, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land, now this is when you come into Israel, okay, this is their, they're on their way uh, through the 40 years of, uh, of wandering. They're coming into Israel. This is what I want you to do. He says, When you come into the land, which I shall give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Now, most of you have heard of a Sabbath. What day of the week is Sabbath? Saturday, okay? And how many days are there till the next Sabbath? Huh? Six days in between and the seventh day of Sabbath. So every seventh day is Sabbath. So we think of a Sabbath as every seventh day, right? And it's Saturday. Listen to this. Verse 3, six years you shall sow your fields, and six years you shall prune your vineyards and gather in its crops. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your fields, nor prune your vineyards. Your harvest after growth you shall not reap, and your grapes uh, grapes of untrimmed vines you shall not gather. The land shall have a sabbatical rest on the seventh year. And all of you shall have, a, shall have the Sabbath products of the land for food yourselves and your male and female servants and your hired men and your foreign uh, residents and those who are aliens with you, even your cattle and the animals that are in your land shall have all the crops to eat. So you're not going to, you're not going to gather them all. You're not going to, you know, sell them off and make a profit. This is a land for the land of rest. Whatever it produces, it produces and whatever it doesn't, it doesn't. Now, do we do that in the United States? Well, in the early days, I think we did. Now, what do the farmers do? We call it crop rotation, right? Because if you put the same crop in the same place too many times, it depletes the land. And the way the, the Lord set it up is just leave it grow this, the seventh year. Plow it all under, and then six years reap, seventh years do it. They did not follow God's lessons. For 490 years, they never took a Sabbath year. They kept on it. Plowing the land, tilling the land, getting their crops. Now, who's the math wizard in here that can tell me what, how many Sabbath years there are in 490 years? 490 divided by seven is what? 70. God says, you have not done what I said, so I'm going to stack up all those Sabbath years back to back and put them all in a row. And we're not going to look at the scripture, but there's actually a scripture in the verse that says, that's why you're going into captivity. I'm giving the land the rest, the 70 years rest. You've not given it over the last 490 years. I'm going to send you out of here. And that's why Israel had this 70-year captivity. They were not obeying God. God had a lot of patience. And finally, he said, the end is the end. Now, let me look at one more scripture, and then we'll go back to here and continue on. And I want to go to uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. Ezra and Nehemiah go back, Ezekiel, Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. Here, um, in fact, we'll, we'll start in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books, in the books, what books is he talking about? The scriptures, the Old Testament books. Let me give you a, a little bit of insight here. It doesn't say here. He was reading the book of Jeremiah. He was reading one of Jeremiah's prophecies. 
Daniel's studying. He's a prophet. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a preacher. He's an expounder of the word of God. And so he's reading Daniel, or he's reading Jeremiah. So it says, um, I'm going to go back here. I just lost my place. After 9, verse 2, the plague flipped. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of years which was revealed at the word of the Lord to who? Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely, how many years? Seventy years. Daniel understood that they were going to be there 70 years and they were going back. He was planning for it. He had all these numbers in his head thinking, when is this going to end? I mean, he had a good idea. When we talk about prophecy, he was understanding the prophecy. So let's go back to uh, Ezra chapter 1, and this is the background that we have uh, in this particular section. And if you want to write down a a verse, you can write down 2 Chronicles 36, 21. That's a section that says they went 70 years because they ignored 490 years of of the Sabbath rests. So as we come back here, I would like to give a lesson as we go through these. If you go to the next slide there, please, uh, Sean, um, and then bring up the uh, lesson for this morning from uh, point one, and it's this. Acknowledging God's righteousness prevents detours from his discipline. Israel had not done what God wanted to do. And what did God do? He sent them on a detour, a, a, a long detour for 70 years to a foreign land. For us as believers, I believe that when we ignore God's will in our lives, when we act unrighteously and don't do what he wants us to do, that he disciplines us. And when he disciplines us, we have detours in our lives. And we're going this way, and all of a sudden we wind up going this way. And some people say, Pastor, why did this happen to me? And I feel like, and I've said this numerous times, I feel like sometimes, look at what you're doing in your life, you know? I mean, you're, you're offending one of the major laws that God has. Now, I'm not saying that because we forget to pray in the morning, God's going to, you know, discipline us. What I'm saying is we're not following God's word, and Israel was not following God's word, and he took them on a detour, a 70-year detour in a foreign land. Acknowledging God's righteousness prevents detours from his discipline. And that's the lesson from, run one, from verse 1. Uh, the first part. Let's look at the second section of this, verses 1 through 4. King Cyrus and Acts of the Decree of God. Uh, in verses, uh, we pick up in the second half of verse 1, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and put it in writing, saying, thus says the Lord, the Cyrus, the king, the Lord of heaven has given me the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem. Uh, I find this interesting. Here's a pagan king who is appointed to build a Jewish temple in Jerusalem. This is why I started off the questions asking, who is our president? Whether you didn't like the last president, you don't like this president, or maybe you don't like any presidents. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Whatever. God uses multiple people. They don't have to be believers. They don't have to be doing exactly what he wants. He can use them to accomplish his means. And that's what he does. He takes Cyrus. Now, was Cyrus a believer? I don't know Cyrus' background. He was a pagan king as far as I know, but as we, as we look at him, uh, we're not sure. But he gave an, what I call an operations order. Now in the military, and we don't have any, I don't think we have our military guys with us this morning, there's a, well, we, in the army we have what we call a five paragraph operations order. First one's the situation, first paragraph. The enemy forces and the friendly forces. So that's the Satan and God's forces in this case. Second is the mission. Third one is our execution, which is operations. And in the, in the army, we call it the S3, okay? They're the operations one. They always think they're the big wigs, and they have all the control because they're telling you what everybody else what to do. Then there's the paragraph four, which is service support. That has in it the logistics you need, which is the S4, we call them in the army, and the personnel, which is the S1. So you get S1 personnel, S4 logistics, and S3 operations. Those are the three. Then the last one, the fifth paragraph, is, um, is uh, communications, basically, command and control. So who's going to have, who's gonna, um, uh, who's gonna have the, uh, not really command and control, it's, it's command and signal, who's going to have the control, and how are they going to signal, how are they going to communicate with us, and that's through prayer. So there's, but there's three basic parts that you have with everyone, the operations, personnel, and logistics. And as we look at the scriptures here, Cyrus gave all three. Look at verse, look at verse uh, two. I will build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. That's the operation order. The operation, he's going to build a a temple. Now, did Cyrus, was he a believer? How connected he was? Well, Daniel had a great impact on these pagan people. And as 
some Christians can on our uh, highest officials if they're in the right spot. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 1, and this will be the last time I'm going to go out of the book, I think, here. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. Let me just read this one verse to you. It says here, one page over. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel and the message was true and one of great conflict, but he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. So in Cyrus's third year, Daniel is still in control and he has this vision. What was Daniel's impact on Cyrus? I have no idea. But he may have been the one that kind of had the, through this, gave him the vision or told him about this or God may have talked to Cyrus directly. So I don't know if he was a, a believer uh, and he was impacted by Daniel or if he was just a pagan leader who was doing what God wanted him to do. But he, Nebuchadnezzar said, I am the control. In Daniel 4, he says, I've done everything to build this great nation. And what happened to him? He wound up going crazy for a number of years, eating grass, if you remember, crawling around like a cow. His nails got long. And um, if you look at the, if you look in the, uh, uh, you know, internet or whatever, you can probably look up and they'll actually tell you the disease that they think he had, the mental illness. But he had a mental illness for many years and because God came upon him and says, no, that's not Rue. I made you who you are. And I, and I find it interesting. He says, God of heaven has given all the kingdoms of the earth. He recognized what Nebuchadnezzar did. Maybe he learned from Nebuchadnezzar and heard of him. Maybe Daniel told him about it. But he definitely had an acknowledgement of God, and he says, I'm going to build a, um, a house for God. What's the personnel? Look at verse 3. Wherefore, or whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So he's giving them the personnel. Anybody who wants to leave can leave. Seventy years earlier, Nebuchadnezzar forced him out of the land, said, you're staying here. Now, 70 years later, he's saying, if you want to return, you can. Now, if you remember back to your timeline, if you want to turn over your sheet, okay, there's, it's been 70 years since Nebuchadnezzar's first conquering of the land, 606, right? So those people that came out in 606, they have to be over 70 years old in order to remember what the land looked like. But there were two more conquests in 60 years before and 50 years before. 50 years before was the last conquest where he destroyed the temple, burned down Jerusalem, and took those people. Some of those people may have still been alive. So when he's saying anybody who wants to go back, there may have been people who came as 10 years old, 15 years old, and now they're 60 or 65 years old, and they want to go back to their homeland. Some of them may have two children. So you have second generation kids who had never seen what Israel looked back and say, okay, we're going to go back too. So you have both first and second generation people willing to go back. These are the personnel. And then logistics, verse 4. I love this. And every survivor, Jewish person who came in, you're still living, every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place, not the Jews, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods, cattle, and, their, and together with a free will offering for the house of God. He ordered all the non-Jews that are living around the area to support the Jews when they went back. Now, I'm sure the Jews are saying, do we have the finances? Do we have the wherewithal to get back? Sometimes we as believers look at what? We look at our own resources and say, can I do this? We forget God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We forget that he can have unbelievers do things to help us along the way. We ignore that. Someone said uh, to uh, Dr. Wilder, Dr. Wilder once, uh, he was with a bunch of uh, officers uh, in India. This was way back when the British had that. And he said, uh, they said, why do you missionaries come here? Why don't you stay home and mind your own business? And Dr. Wilder looked at him and says, if your commander told you to go to Constantinople, for instance, and carry out a mission, would you do it? Yes. Would you question it? No. We just do it. He said, my orders come from God. And he has said, go to preach the, the, the gospel to every nation. He said, we have no choice. And so it is. When Israel was asked if they want to go back to the land, and God gave them this opportunity, actually this command to Cyrus to build the temple, they had no choice but to go back. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. 
Now, before we do, let me just finish, give, give you the two lessons from this section that I think are appropriate. One, God can use unbelievers, unbelievers to accomplish his will. Don't think that only believers are the ones that you have. When we look at finances, what, what, what the resources we have for the church, when we look at uh, what, what resources you have in your own life, it's not what's in your checkbook. You don't under, understand that God can use unbelievers sometimes to further his duties. The third lesson I want to share with you this morning as we look at this section is God does not ask us to do things he will not resource. God does not ask us to do things he will not resource. If God asks you to do something, he will resource it. You may not know where the money's coming from. You may not know where the stamina is coming from. You may not know where the people are coming from. But if God tells you to do it, what should you do? Do it. That's right. God will resource his will. And we should never forget that because these resources are much different than what you and I have in our pocketbooks or we have in our talents or what we have in our time. Let's go on to the next one, uh, verses five and six. God stirs hearts to do his will. God stirred the people's hearts, it says in verse five. Then the heads of the fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose and everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of, um, the, house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. My question this morning is, has God stirred your heart toward anything? Do you give God the opportunity to affect your heart and make you passionate about something? Are you passionate about something? I mean, some of the young people may be passionate about skateboarding, skiing. My kids like skiing and uh, uh, snowboarding and stuff. You know, all kind, there's all kinds of things we can be passionate about. Some older people get passionate about their cars, their houses, you know, their wealth, their, their, their jobs. But can you, what are you, has God ever stirred you for something for him? I think God stirred some of our people for this mega sports camp a number of years ago. Hal and Adam and a bunch of other people. I mean, they've made a full commitment to make this happen. It's been something for God. Now they're still passionate about some other things, but they're passionate about that. What has God stirred your heart to be passionate about? I look at you, out of you and I know what some of you are passionate about. Others I don't know. Do you allow God to stir your heart to say, I'm passionate about something other than just that stuff which will benefit me? Do you talk to God and let him talk to you? Maybe through his word or through the preacher or through devotions or music? Are you in tune with God? That's kind of why we're here this morning, is to make sure that we get a tune-up once a month at where our heart is. God never gives a mission without giving us the means, but we must take the first step. Notice here in, verse, in this verse, it says, the priest and the Levites arose, and everyone else whose, Lord, whose heart the Lord stirred. They arose. They took the first step. Now you go into verse 6, and it says, and all those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, gold, and goods, and all this kind of stuff. But they arose first. They said, here am I, what? Send me. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do your will. You say, God hasn't given me the ability to do this. God hasn't given me the resource to do this. Maybe it's because you haven't said, here am I. Take me. Let me be the person on the front line with you, God. Because when you say, God, I'm ready to be used, and you're passionate about something, he will use you, and he will resource you. He giveth more grace. I love this song. We've, we, could, we should have probably sung this song today. <laughs> would, have been, would have been good for us. I didn't pick this one. It says, when we've exhausted the store of endurance, some of us are tired. Anybody tired this morning? <laughs> yeah, we get tired. So much going on. When we've exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength is fair or the day is half done, that's the one o'clock nap, siesta, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Dr. Davidson visited a denoted poetess, Myra Welch, years ago. She wrote, The Touch of the Master's Hand. You've heard of that? Touch of the Master's Hand. She was in a wheelchair. Before he left, she tapped the wheelchair. She said, I thank God for this. Why would you thank God for a wheelchair? She said, rather than becoming bitter, bitter at her confinement to a wheelchair, she chose a better way. And when she did, she discovered the ability to write poetry for God's glory. I would have never done that, probably, 
if it hadn't been for this wheelchair. Lesson four. Act on God's will if you want his resources. Don't just sit there and wait for him to give you a bunch of things and say, oh, now I can do it. Act on God's will if you want his resources because he wants us to see that we're ready and willing to act first. God won't give you the money for a mission trip if you never decide to go on a mission trip. God won't give you the uh, property you want unless you make an offer. God won't give us what we need to do our ministry unless we're saying, I'm willing to go. Verses 7 through 11. Nebuchadnezzar helps from the grave. <laughs> I love this part. Nebuchadnezzar was the guy we read about earlier. What he had done, had he done 70 years earlier and 60 years earlier and 50 years older? What did Nebuchadnezzar do? He destroyed what? He destroyed the temple. He burned Jerusalem. He leveled it. This guy was executing God's judgment on Israel for not following him. Bad dude, right? Don't like Nebuchadnezzar. Destruction. Israel saw their precious temple destroyed and all the good things taken away. Was that bad or good? Well, let's take a look at verse 7 with me. Also, King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. And Cyrus king of Persia brought them out by the hand of Midredath the treasurer and he counted them out to Shalbazar who's, who's, um, who's going to be the new governor in Israel uh, um, and he says he counted them out to Shalbazar the prince of Judah we all think that Nebuchadnezzar is a bad guy he destroyed Israel you know God was looking forward and he said they're only going to be here for 70 years Nebuchadnezzar be the caretaker of my stuff. Take it out of here. Take it to your land. And he put it in the house of his own God. Again, he wanted to say, I conquered this. He wasn't thinking that way. But God used Nebuchadnezzar, this evil king who destroyed Israel, to protect his stuff until they came back now, 70 years later, to rebuild the temple. Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Israel loved God, but they weren't doing what God wanted them to do, and he punished them. But he still worked it out for good. I sometimes, when I think of him, I think of um, uh, Hitler. Who would ever think Hitler was a good person? He wasn't. He, he massacred six million Jews. But what was the result of Hitler's massacre of the Jews? The land of Israel today, the nation of Israel. That was the outcome of that horrific war. God used this horrible person in order to lay the groundwork for his plan for Israel for the future. Now, that doesn't make God responsible for the six million Jews. That's all, that's all in Hitler. But God can use ungodly people to do godly things and preserve things that he wants done. So don't count God out just because the person that you wanted to win the election didn't win the election. Don't count God out just because you don't have the money to accomplish what you think he wants you to do. Don't count God out because you don't believe that you have the stamina to handle what he wants you to do. He will give you that if you will arise and stand first and say, I will do it. There was a man, uh, Bernard Gilpin. He was um, accused of heresy and set out for London for his trial. This is back in the days we were talking about where there was a state church. They were going to execute him. He set out for his trial. On the way, this guy broke his leg. Bad thing, right? He had to stop by, recuperate, and get his leg set, and so forth. By the time he was ready to travel again and made his way to London for his execution, the queen died. And he turned around and went home a free man. Who wants to praise God for a broken leg? But God used it to do what he wanted in his life. How do we keep enjoying? Uh, anybody here like to keep track of their budgets? And uh, how many people like doing their budget every, every month? How many people do a budget every month? Anybody? I do. <laughs> My wife hates it. I got the job, okay? How many people love math? Okay, well, I'll tell you what. God loves accounting. 
Look at verses 8, 9, and 10. Now, this was their number, 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 duplicates, 30 gold bowls, 410 silver bowls of a second kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400 5, bowls. Now, if you go into chapter 2, he breaks it down into all the people that went, what the tribes are from, what the households are from, how much, they, how much the stuff they took. God loves accounting. And we need to be good accountants with what God gives us, okay? And some of us aren't. But the lesson five that I give you this morning from this section is God's will sometimes includes detours. God's will sometimes include de includes detours. And for us, when, when a detour comes, recognize that God's will may be there. The Nebuchadnezzar, who took things away from us, can have them for us in the future. Chapter two, chapter two I'm just going to uh, mention a few things. The rubber bull was the leader. Uh, that went back with them. If you look in chapter one, verse two, um, uh, chapter two, verses one and two, Zerubbabel actually was a royal um, descendant who, again, Nebuchadnezzar took to Babylon to save. He wound up going back as the prince. And if you look in Matthew chapter one and two, you'll find that he is of the descendants of Joseph, Jesus' father, and why he was one of the reasons why he was eligible to be king and, and in that worship line. If you look at verses, um, if you look in um, this chapter two also, you'll find they took, it enumerates exactly how many servants they took, how many singers they took for the temple. Guess what? That's the deacons and the worship team. <laughs> they couldn't go back from, it, from uh, their captivity without taking the deacons and the worship team along with them also. Everybody's important when we worship God in the church. And then lastly, there were personal gifts to rebuild the, te the temple, and that's in verses 68 to 70. And... Um, it's interesting that, again, he reiterates all the gifts that were given to them from people who were ungodly and supported them on their way back. We must realize that the, the funds we have are not our own. They're God's. Everything we have is God's. And the unbelievers don't know this either. But everything they have is also God's. And God can take it like that, and he can give it like that. And he can encourage them to give it to us or to give to other believers in order to accomplish his work. Jonathan Yoda was a friend of mine. His church received a large donation from a man that didn't even know who had died in the, in the community. He had wanted to give money to the church, and he had fallen out with all the other churches, and he gave them the money. There was another guy that in, in Greenport, actually one of the churches we were considering going to before we came here. When I got there, they told us the story. They had received uh, $75,000 from a man in the community who decided to get, split his wealth between three churches in the community. And Greenport was way out on Long Island. It was a smaller church than ours. God can give us the resources for whatever we want. We need to remember the parable of the talents. Whatever he gives us, we need to invest and use for his glory. Faithfulness accomplishes his will. Faithfulness accomplishes his will. As we close, our I, I trying to try to bring all of this stuff down. If you put that, uh, Sean, put that uh, lesson up for them to see there, so they can write it down. Uh, as we come to the uh, final one, this is my theme for the morning. I'm bringing all this stuff together into one sentence is hard, but this is what I came up with. If you find it helpful, it's this: Allow God to stir your heart and resource His will in your life. Allow God to, God to stir your heart and resource His will in your life. Are you ready to allow him to do that? This morning, it's our time to take a look at the communion, to have communion, and to say, God sacrificed Jesus Christ for us. How do we relate to him? Are we willing to allow him to stir our hearts? Is there anything keeping us? Is there any sin that's going to give us a detour like the Israel had? Let's get rid of it right here this morning. Let's pray about it. Let's leave it at the, let's leave it at the table and let's move on for the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, we thank you for the ability to live in this free country and yet allow us also to be a fervent and dedicated witness for you. Allow unbelievers to take a look at us and know that Jesus Christ is first. Allow our passion to show, not, not necessarily our passion for some activity or some job or some uh, luxury or, or, or some hobby, but allow our passion for you to show through. May people, when they talk to us, know that we're different and see that we're different. And may we accomplish your will in this life. May all of our resources be at your disposal to do what you want with them. In Jesus' name.
Amen.